Next up on This Week in Law, we're going to look at the life and intellectual property contributions of the late, great Steve Jobs. Lots to say and much sadness this week with his passing. We're also going to look at current disputes involving Apple, including the Apple versus Samsung and Samsung versus Apple patent fray. We're going to look at other Android patent issues and also Mal Reynolds rides again, along with Sherwin C. from Public Knowledge. Uh, from Internet Cases, we've got Evan Brown and Terry Hart from Copyright next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 132, recorded October 7, 2011. Scalia in a cocktail dress. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Vast Conference, the ultimate in professionalism, clarity, and flexibility for your conference calls, all at a low price. For two Vast Conference calls free with no commitment, go to vastconference.com and use promo code TWILL. Hello and welcome back to This Week in Law. You've tuned in to a great episode this week. We've got a wonderful panel of folks to discuss the technology news of the week. And I'd like to welcome them right now. We've got Sherwin C. returning to the show. Hello, Sherwin. Hi, good to be here. Good to see you again. Sherwin is from Public Knowledge and we're thrilled to have him back. A newcomer to the show is Terry Hart of Copy Hype. Hi, Terry. Hi, Denise. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you for having me. And an old comer to the show is Evan Brown in Chicago. Hello, Evan. Hey, Denise. How's it going? It's, uh, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, too. All right, so I want to um, start things off with kind of the news, the very sad news of the week, because I think uh, that there's probably no human being who has, at least personally for me, uh, most influenced uh, my interest in intellectual property and creativity and innovation more than Steve Jobs. And uh, we are, of course, very, very sad to lose him and um, very awed by everything he was able to accomplish in his short 56 years on the planet. Um, so we, I wanted to um, sort of delve into the life of Steve Jobs with respect to how he's impacted copyright law and other forms of innovation. Um, for folks who, uh, who aren't as familiar with all of the early days and the early um, doings of Apple, I have a couple of recommendations for you. Uh, Stephen Levy's amazing book, Insanely Great, is a wonderful um, perspective and history on those early days. And uh, also there was a Robert X. Cringely PBS series a few years back that was called Triumph of the Nerds. And it became uh, the basis of the rather kind of hokey movie, The Pirates of Silicon Valley. But uh, Triumph of the Nerds was a documentary and uh, it was in three parts, the third of which was called Great Artists Steal which uh, I think <laughs> kind of sums up um, a lot of at least the knock on Steve Jobs and uh, how he made Apple so insanely great. Um, I'm old enough to remember, and I assume you guys are too, when computing, for example, did not involve a mouse. Uh, and so the, the big story about Steve Jobs uh, back in the day was that he cruised on over to Xerox Park one day um, saw the Alto that they were using over there, uh, one of the first personal computers ever made, and uh, saw its graphical user interface with Windows and the mouse. And uh, lo and behold, in short order, we had the Macintosh. So I wanted to uh, toss that one out for our discussion today. There's a great article in the New Yorker uh, by Malcolm Gladwell that sort of debunks some of those myths about that um, event and what happened there. And he points out that really you don't see um, 
a serial reproduction of something like the mouse over time as you compare Douglas Engelbart's version to the Xerox version to what ultimately Apple conceived of and marketed, uh, what you see is the evolution of a concept. And uh, that's, that's something I think that's interesting from our intellectual property perspective here on Twill. What do you think, Terry? Um, yeah, I really uh, enjoyed that New Yorker article, and I thought they really uh, caught the gist of that. You know, each of these uh, people that were involved in developing the mouse, you know, they each had different uh, goals, different purposes for doing that. And uh, so it wasn't like a straight line from, you know, the original mouse to the one that we have on our personal computers. It was sort of these three separate leaps and, um, you know, that's uh, in a way how a lot of things get innovated. And it was, uh, I really enjoyed that article and especially how Steve Jobs, you know, came back from Park and, you know, told his uh, engineers, you know, okay, let's, uh, you know, I saw this great thing, the mouse, and let's do it, but let's make it cost 15 bucks instead of, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars. And, and just uh, the story of them putting that together and actually accomplishing that, you know, that really gets to the heart of uh, the type of innovation that Steve Jobs has sort of exemplified over the over his short lifespan. Right. Hey, Sherwin, I don't know if I, I did speak for you um, that you remember a day when computers did not have <laughs> a mouse. Is that true? Oh, no. No, that's definitely true. I mean, uh, uh -huh. I think the first computer, the first computer that we had in my house was probably an Apple II Plus, which most definitely didn't have a mouse. Uh, it had a you know a five and a quarter inch floppy drive, which was a, a, a you know an add-on, um, and I don't think it had any. Well, I don't think it had any hard drive at all. Um, but I, I think you know. One of the criticisms that we hear people make about Steve Jobs is, oh, oh, he, he didn't invent all of these things. Um, he was just a marketer. And I think that that does, a lot of people have been making the point that that does miss the point a little bit. Uh, and it's not just a question of, I mean, you know, people throw around the word genius a lot. And, you know, especially with the genius bar and whatnot. But uh, I think the idea is that, you know, you're not trying to quantify genius in terms of the number of patents somebody has or the the market cap of their company i mean there's there's the the sort of the einstein model of what we think of a genius is and there's also sort of the edison model and i think uh steve jobs really fits into that edison model where you know there's this romantic myth of edison working late into the night on his workshop at, on the light bulb and all of this but he was also the head of a massive company uh that that where people were engineers were working for him and assigning patents for, uh, to him uh, or putting you know filing them in his name and that's not misappropriation that's not a, a bad thing it's, it's a great thing that um that you have somebody who has just you know the ability to uh to to take ideas that are there and implement them and and be stubborn enough and i think that's one of the things that's famously true about him is that he was, you know, he could be very stubborn to take what seems to be a good idea and, and actually work at it hard enough to get it out there into the market and make it something good and useful and wonderful. I mean, you know, he didn't invent the MP3 player. Apple didn't invent the MP3 player, but this is a, this is a great little device. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it refined it in a, in a way and got it to the market in such a way that it really took over uh, in a way that it hadn't before. And that's, that's fantastic. Right, that little device you're holding in your hand changed a whole industry. Changed not just the music industry, but the, the entire entertainment oh, yeah. industry, um, which I, know, think, I think... Go ahead. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, we think of uh, media in a completely different way. I mean, and the fact is, it's not the technologies that made it so much different. It isn't the fact that MP3 encoding and compression was, was invented that makes it so different. It was the ubiquity of the device that made people really think about their music collections in a very different way. Just in the way that, you know, the technology of magnetic video recording uh, didn't change the way people thought about their relationship to movies, but the presence of a VCR in everyone's home did. Right. Um, Evan, I'm uh, wondering what you thought and if you saw uh, Stefan Kinsella's post yesterday about Steve Jobs' patents, which Sherwin was just alluding to. Um, it was a very interesting 
uh, that just before uh, the day Steve died, he actually was issued yet another patent in his name for um, the OS 10 dock. And uh, Stefan did a nice job of running down uh, the various patents that were, are held in the name of Steve Jobs, 312 of them to be exact, 269 of them being design patents. What do you think, Evan? That speaks pretty loudly as to the kind of uh, mind that, that Steve Jobs had. You know, there were also a handful of patents in his name, uh, you know, not associated with Apple, presumably when he was with Next there, you know, in that in that 10 year period or whatever that, that period of, of time. Mm -hmm. And w where I see his real genius and his savvy use of intellectual property, both in terms of exploiting it and protecting it is in the way that he really had uh, more than perhaps anyone else, uh, one foot in two pretty distinct worlds. He was a technological genius, and uh, the the fact that he had all of these patents in his name, where he's listed as an inventor, speaks to his um, uh, almost peerless technological acumen. Uh, but but what I think uh, what what obviously has elevated him to a uh, you know, semi-divine kind of status among his followers is his ability to communicate. It's an understatement to, to say that throughout his career, you saw this theme, this motif of simplicity and elegance, which presumably comes from, uh, you know, the way that he fostered his creative side uh, you know, there's definitely a mystical aspect to some of the things that he was into. I, I don't think there's any dispute. I don't. I think it's, isn't it, uh, pretty well in the the public record that he traveled in India and Nepal and took LSD and you know has this real deep insight and and also you know uses a lot of these Buddhist principles uh, in the in the design and the uh, uh, and and the manufacture of things and the and also in the way that they're presented. He's a he's an uh, he's, his communication style was unlike uh, anything else. So what I the way I see it, um, what really sets him apart and puts him in the same escalon as Edison, and I've seen a lot of comparisons to Da Vinci as well. And you know, and only time's going to going to really tell us where you know he really it fits into this historical perspective. Two days after the fact of his death, we're in no position to really be all that accurate about it. But what what really in my mind sets him apart is the way that he managed these these two disparate elements of the world uh, within himself, the brilliance in a technological sense and the brilliance in the communicative and design uh, aesthetic sense as, as well. Right, and, and I would add to that, that the fact that he valued change, positive change, um, so greatly and had no patience for those who couldn't share his vision and uh, the way in which he would just, you know, push them along to the place where uh, they needed to be in order to achieve that vision of his. I saw him speak back in 03 at the first D conference and uh, Walt Mossberg was asking him about the beginnings of Apple Computer and the challenges that they faced then. And he said, you know, the biggest challenge that we had was that people couldn't type, but we knew that death would eventually take care of this. So, you know, I think in, in some instances he was waiting, he was willing to wait out what needed to happen uh, for the change he envisioned. And in others, he wasn't, you know, with the, the music and the movie industries, he, he just wasn't waiting for those dinosaurs to, uh, to go by the wayside and let change happen that way. He went and, and was the agent for that change in many different ways. Uh, Terry, wh what do you think about his impact on those industries? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think you could uh, overstate it enough um, as far as iTunes goes. You know, looking back at the past decade, um, it's difficult to pick out anything else that has had such an impact on the music industry. You know, it, it, it changed the way that people consume music. It, it changed... Uh, like I said, it's difficult to overstate that. And um, as far as the movie industry, too, um, just on, on kind of to the side, his role in, in Pixar, you know, um, 
he certainly played a pivotal role in helping that uh, film studio uh, become the successful film studio that it is today. And, uh, you know, I think um, just his attitude toward uh, bridging the gap sort of between these techno the technology world and the creative world, um, you know, you see it in Pixar, you see it in iTunes that he didn't think that these uh, two industries should be at odds with each other. You know, he, he looked for the way to bridge that. And, you know, I think he succeeded with iTunes, you know, and certainly that's inherent in his role in Pixar. And uh, I think, you know, that's his biggest uh, contribution in, in over his lifespan to the way that these industries has changed. Right. One thing that is is pivotal to those industries and has traditionally been is the notion of if they're going to enter into this world where things are distributed over the Internet, they're certainly going to be wrapped in DRM. Um, that is until Steve Jobs came, comes along in uh, February of 07 and writes his open letter on fair play and DRM free music and uh, proclaims that EMI is on board. Uh, to offer their works for um, in a di in a digital rights management free way on the iTunes Store, and by '09, all the record labels were on board. You know, you could argue that uh, that Amazon's making things available in a DRM free form certainly aided that process as well. But yeah, you know, when you've got someone like Steve Jobs lending the weight of his personality and conviction to such an issue, um, I believe it's only a matter of time <laughs> until people <laughs> begin to see the light. Uh, Sherwin, were you surprised that he was able to pull that off? Uh, I, you know, I I went into, when, when, when those announcements were made, I was, I was really excited about it and I wasn't sure how it was going to end up, whether or not it was going to work, you know, whether or not the other labels would play along or not, because there had been a long track record of them being very suspicious of digital media. So uh, it was, it was a, huge, uh, a huge coup and I'm, I'm glad to see that it worked and I, don't, I think that we're all the better for it. Um, I, you know, there's, there's that aspect of, of having that, that um, sort of idealism combined with the pragmatism though. I mean, I don't think iTunes would have gotten off the ground the way it did if they hadn't put these licensing deals in place at first uh, to show people this is not something threatening. This is something that could be incredibly good for artists as well. Uh, and that provided a, a, a... I think we may have uh Sure, when frozen there, or I think perhaps he's thinking. lost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he had a deep thought to ponder there. Hopefully, we can get him back. Um, yeah, well, th this pretty much covers uh, what I wanted to on on you know the legacy of Steve Jobs. But I would like to just go around and and see if any of you have any last thoughts before we move on to other topics that uh, happened this week, including some Apple and Android litigation oriented news. Evan, any further wrap up thoughts about the passing of Steve Jobs? Well, we've kind of talked about this perhaps impliedly and, and I, was, I was referring to the way that Steve Jobs has did uh, rather ingeniously navigate the, uh, the, the waters of, of intellectual property law. You know, some would say, uh, some would criticize him for, for taking so freely in the world of the, the late 70s, you know, from Xerox and all of that, uh, you know, that context and stuff. But let's also not forget how um, strict he was when it came to protecting Apple's intellectual property in a number of, of ways you can look at this. There's all the complicated patent stuff, and that, that, that world is such a thicket, so I'll just kind of, you know, put that as a, as a, um, as, as a point on all this. But, um, you know, going back to the old days of uh, protecting the user interface vis-a-vis -vis Windows, you know, with the, the litigation that, that went, you know, for pretty much the first half of the, the 90s on that, the, the whole idea of the copyrightability of the Windows uh, user interface. Uh, another example, if you remember back from 1996, remember how aggressively Apple went after uh, the publishers, uh, what was it, Mac Rumors? I can't remember. It was the, that, that uh, Apple v. Doe's case that went up to the, uh, 
uh, the Court of Appeals there in California where Apple tried to get the contents of those email communications when somebody had leaked information in 2004 about an upcoming uh, release of an Apple uh, product. Uh, you know, the, the very aggressive stance they took on that, they were unsuccessful in getting those email messages because of the Stored Communications Act. And then, of course, you know, look at the look at how vigorously they, um, you know, were uptight about the loss of the prototype uh, iPhone 4. I hate bringing this up because if Ernie's ever back on the show, I've got to wear the New, uh, New Orleans Saints jersey about this. But right, that's um, you coming know, up, by the way. <laughs> Oh, great. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of examples where, uh, you, you know, there, there's no argument, despite Steve Jobs and his openness with DRM, there's, there was obviously much, a bunch of ulterior motives behind, you know, thinking that DRM is bad back when he, you know, did those announcements um, a few years ago. Because, you know, he was very much a strict intellectual property person. You know, he, you know, he's definitely on the side of strong IP rights. And so it's interesting that, you know, we have the norm, um, you know, probably among the same, a lot of the same people who are enthusiastic about Apple and its brand would also be in favor of, I'm grossly stereotyping and overgeneralizing here. So here's where the tomatoes come flying. Um, but, you know, ha, you know, it's interesting to think about how we, we love Steve Jobs. We love his persona. We love the cult that, uh, that, that arises around it. But, you know, he was very much a strong intellectual property rights kind of guy. So a little bit of a paradox or an irony in all of that. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Terry? Any uh, final thoughts about Steve before we move on to other topics? Um, no, I can't really think of anything to add. I mean, I feel a little bit out of the loop because... Um, Unlike you, uh, you know, I never owned a Mac. I never owned a, an iPod or an iPhone. So, you know, I'm kind of on the outside looking in. But I, you know, I definitely appreciate um, the the skills and talents that Steve Jobs had. You know, if you look at innovation and just being able to to make, you know, technology that changes the way we live, um, there's so many moving parts. You know, not just the the, the mechanics of the technology, but the marketing, the usability, the price point, you know, it's very rare for a company or an individual to, to hit on all of these different parts even once. And um, to his credit, Steve Jobs didn't do that just once. He did it a number of times over the past couple of decades. So, I mean, looking forward, you know, uh, we could only hope that there's, you know, more Steve Jobs out there. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think we can only hope. Sherwin, uh, I, I think we've got you back. Uh, we're we're just sort of um, closing out our thoughts about Steve Jobs and his impact on the world of technology innovation. Uh, Evan had some good points about how it's um, he was not exactly in a free and open IP kind of guy, not exactly a creative commons kind of guy. Uh, and yet, you know, we still um, appreciate and respect uh, what he contributed to the world. Um, any thoughts about that dichotomy? Well, sure. I mean, I, you know, I think that we, we can't, um, I, I think, you know, the way that history progresses, the way that technology progresses isn't, isn't going to be defined by is isn't doesn't follow any one sort of ideological um, narrative. So you know his his role in creating, if not you know creating or bringing to market or uh, designing or or allow bringing those inventions and those designs together and and marketing them wonderfully. Uh, all of those, regardless of what his stance might have been on any particular, you know, aspect of copyright debates, I think is, it's, it's changed the world uh, for the better. And it's done great things in terms of how we think about the distinctions between hardware and media and software and media and content and, and, uh, and tangible objects. Uh, and I, I think that the, the world has been a better place for Steve Jobs having been in it. Yeah, I think uh, had he not done what he did, uh, we would definitely be in a place where there had been no economic accommodation uh, between the piracy that you saw possible with Napster and the culture that that would have gone further down that road. Uh, I think it's... 
Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I think it's possible that that would have happened. I think that his his positioning made it possible for that to happen sooner, right? Mm-hmm. His willingness to, to, to work in both uh, to work both in the to be in the technology world and to work with uh, the entertainment industry really helped that along. Yeah, and you I know mean, another I, great. Ahead. Another great way of illustrating his impact uh, in the world at large was, uh, did you see that the Westboro, is it a Baptist church? You know, the one that's always, the, the church that's always oh, going yeah, and protesting yeah. military funerals. You see, you, do you hear about this, Sherwin? Um, they, uh, they put out a tweet, I think it was Wednesday night or sometime yesterday, that they are indeed going to protest Steve Jobs' funeral because, you know, he had this position of power and influence and visibility and and didn't you know proclaim the glory of God like he should have according to the Westboro Baptist Church and so therefore they're going to to protest but the the funny thing is if you look at the metadata on the tweet that it was uh, uh, somebody was using an iPhone to, to tweet that so there's there's <laughs> certainly a great example of unintended consequences for the, the use and the adoption of this technology for the improvement of mankind in as much as the Westboro Baptist Church is responsible for any improvement of mankind yeah, that's a great anecdote, and, and I, I have, I'm still in awe over here of the fact that Terry has never owned an iPod or an iPhone <laughs> or a Mac. <laughs> well, I, I just, you know, to jump into Terry's, to jump to Terry's defense slightly, um, <laughs> this this iPod is the only uh, Apple uh, product that I own. Uh, I, I'm, I'm talking to you on a Mac right now. It's a work, it's a work uh, machine, and this was a gift. And it's what six years old now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it but certainly was. I still uh, can appreciate their great devices. <laughs> it 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 wasn't something I planned. It just you know it happened that uh, you know I just kind of never got around to uh, getting a Mac product, getting an Apple product. My first computer was actually an Amiga one thousand. But uh, other than that, I've been you know PC just. Um, just how it worked out, I guess. Well, if you're going to talk about the Amiga, you can salvage some nerd cred. That's all good. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, my my son, when he heard that Steve Jobs had passed, looked at me with just complete sadness and dread and said, Mom, you mean it's all over? And so I, I certainly uh, don't believe that that's, he's only seven. <laughs> I certainly don't believe that that's the case and that the, the legacy will uh, continue long beyond the actual man. Um, and one way in which it's doing that is the struggle between uh, the various phone hardware and software uh, makers and providers. Um, a couple of things that have come up just recently have to do with uh, the Samsung and Apple disputes just uh, before the announcement of Steve's death. Uh, There was um, also news that over in Europe, Samsung is going to block or attempt to block the iPhone 4S from uh, being marketed and sold there um, on the theory that it is infringing Samsung's patents and so we've um, got that going on. Uh, Evan, any thoughts about this and uh, what it means in the whole patent wars between these country, uh, companies? Well, I don't know if it should mean a whole lot or whether it should come as much of a surprise because, you know, watching a lot of the coverage on um, Tuesday, wow, what a what a week it's been, um, mm-hmm. y- you know, when, when, the re- when the commentators were coming out, you know, what's new in the iPhone 4S, you know, Apple, of course, did a great job of making us think that a lot of the stuff they were talking about was indeed new that wasn't in the iPhone 4. So, you know, I, I don't, for that very reason, there's so much an overlap in these technologies. It's not a brand new phone. It's not an iPhone 5. You know, why are we surprised that, uh, that Samsung is, um, taking an aggressive position in, in a dispute that's been going on that we know for quite some time. Right. Uh, and, and I think we'll be going on for quite some time as, as the two of them just keep putting wood to this fire. Uh, Sherwin, any thoughts on uh, the Apple Samsung disputes and uh, this latest development? Well, uh, I, I guess not specifically on the on the Apple Samsung issue. I mean, the fact that that you have these this ability to to create uh, import restrictions in parallel to having, you know, civil litigation on patents just means that there's another, 
another tool for for companies to to slug it out over devices um, and I, I don't know that it it, it it feels a bit disconnected from uh, a lot of the other IT, IP debates that, that happen because it feels like it's really between large companies just exchanging money. I know there was this, this story with uh, Google and Microsoft having this all back and forth and Microsoft having a press release that essentially said, or a blog post, essentially saying that, look, you know, uh, we're getting these, these licenses from people, people are paying licensing fees and every, everything continues as normal, so that's fine. There isn't a problem here. Uh, and of course, maybe there isn't for those companies that can afford to litigate this out to have transactional lawyers uh, working through these cross licenses and who can afford to pay those fees. Um, I think it, it matters a great deal more and it's, it's much less visible when you get companies that might not make it to market, uh, might not become visible uh, because they've got uh, potential patent liability from who knows what kind of patents waiting out in the wings. Maybe it's just because I've I've spent the last couple of days sort of remembering the career and the intellectual property ups and downs of Steve Jobs and his contributions. But the Samsung and Apple case reminds me a lot of the Microsoft GUI wars back in the day, uh, which primarily involved copyright, uh, but still, you know, the whole look and feel uh, issues that were litigated there. Um, Terry, do you have any thoughts on uh, the Samsung as, as maybe a point of evolution from way back when? Um, not too much more than what's been already said. I mean, patents kind of out of my wheelhouse, but um, yeah, I think, um, you know, like Sherwin said, this is, you know, two companies duking it out and uh, two big companies duking it out. And that's kind of how the GUI wars were. You know, uh, Microsoft and Apple uh, did have business arrangements, and this kind of arose out of, uh, you know, business arrangement gone sour. They duke it out in court. They later settle. Things get worked out with the lawyers. So, you know, this is, you know, common. It's something we're going to see every now and then. And, uh, you know, that's just how, how it is. Um, um, and as Sherwin mentioned, you know, this could have an effect on the smaller companies. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I did like the, uh, I guess it was a tweet that Microsoft sent in response to Google that basically said, wow. Yeah, so let's talk about least. that. Because, because outside the iOS world, in, in, in other phone news, uh, where Microsoft and HTC and Samsung have all come to accommodations where those two companies are going to pay Microsoft for what it says are its patented elements that are present in the Android operating system, uh, setting a precedent you know, that I think others will have very little choice but to follow. Um, aside from uh, that being interesting from the legal standpoint, it's, it's also interesting from the way it has played out publicly with the companies, you know, instead of giving um, the typical PR press release about how, you know, we disagree with Microsoft's assertions and will be vigorously enforcing or protecting the our partners rights in Android or whatever you might expect Google to say in legalese. Instead, what we get is the tweet that says, wow. <laughs> and what I'm referring to is um, uh, an actual, let's see if I can find the actual uh, tweet. Um, as someone was uh, uh, asking the uh, head of Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's communication about Google's claim that these payments to Microsoft were extortionary. Um, and and uh, actually, I think it's, uh, let, let me pull this up. It's MG Siegler over at TechCrunch. And uh, here we go. Here's the, he's got the whole thing. Uh, let me boil down the Google statement they gave to MG Siegler from 48 words to one. Wow. 
<laughs> right, Seth, Frank X. Shaw from Microsoft. Um, so it's it's sort of a, a change from um, what we're used to in discourse about legal disputes, don't you think, Evan? <laughs> well, yeah, and you know we've got the platform, so might as well might as well use it. It's uh, there are obviously a couple of different fronts here. There's the, uh, the you know any litigation you know, the proxy war that's going on in litigation, then there's the negotiations over licensing and the rejection of that. And then the third front would be the, the forward, you know, the public facing public relations aspect. And so this fits uh, very well into that. And so, you know, what's there to be lost and, you know, a little bit of public bravado uh, when, when it comes to, to all of this stuff. There's, um, you know, if anything, it's a bit refreshing to see that it's not uh, all in the same kind of uh, formal uh, language. Maybe it was just uh, something to kind of have an antidote to, uh, you know, Google what they said in their, uh, in their, uh, you know, uh, comments on this. You know, Google's comment was a little bit formal talking about, um, you know, seeing the same tactic over and over again. And, and this is, this is extortion and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that there can be some levity to it because otherwise this patent stuff can get pretty dry. Right. Steve Jobs didn't tweet, but that's the kind of comment you might have seen in an email from him back to uh, someone if he had been so inclined. Um, yes. <laughs> Sherwin, do you, what do you think about this as, as a precedent for other handset makers uh, using Android? Do you think they're all just going to have to come hat and checkbook in hand to Microsoft? And, and do you think Google will do anything about it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I do have to say that, uh, you know, it, it, obviously it doesn't set a legal precedent, right? But I, it, it certainly, um, the few, the more people who decide to, to come forward and start licensing, the, the uh, you know, the fewer there are to sort of band together to decide to, to maybe litigate and try and uh, duke it out over what these, act, these patents actually say. And I, I think that there's, I mean, moving away from sort of the, the business relationship question of it and, and uh, how you know this affects people's entry into the market I, I i i really wonder about what this says about i mean how the idea of how we think about patents really affects um the way that these cases are viewed and the way that they move forward i mean you know we talk about patents and there's this sort of romantic myth of, of the lone inventor and when it, when it comes to software it really is rarely like that i mean i have a friend who used to work for microsoft he got a patent uh, which was, you know, he in, made an invention, a software invention, which was assigned to Microsoft. And I, I might be misremembering, but I remember asking him about this. And he said, basically, you know, the, he wasn't, he didn't, you know, go to a workshop and code by himself and come up with this invention and then present it to Microsoft saying, I think we can use this. He was just trying to accomplish a specific task. And then later on, uh, somebody in his group says, oh, yeah, you should send that over to legal and they'll get a patent for it. So the idea wasn't that, you know, this great invention, this wonderful thing, which is now, you know, he, he got a nice little trophy for it. Uh, it's not this, you know, wonderful thing that has pr promoted the progress of the useful arts, um, uh, you know, throughout. It's something that he was going to do anyway, because it solved a very particular problem that they were trying to do. Um, and I think there's uh, too many software patents that are, and the, the thing about uh, patents is that unlike copyrights, uh, you don't have a defense for independent invention, meaning that if somebody else completely separately came up with the exact same thing uh, later, after the patent had been uh, uh, had, been, had been applied for, had been issued, had been granted, etc., um, they're out of luck. And there's so many people working on so many different bits of software, uh, so many innovations going on at the same time, that this this just creates this thicket. Um, that uh, that can impede, uh, you know, innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, as long as we're on the topic of thickets, uh, I want to very shortly here get into talking about the new Orphan Works litigation over uh, Google Book Search. And uh, also want to get into talking about um, some privacy considerations uh, that are being taken up by the state of California with respect to ebooks. And the Supreme Court has started its new fall term. So we've got all that coming up ahead with Sherwin C. from Public Knowledge and Terry Hart, 
from Copy Hype and Evan Brown from Internet Cases. But before we get to all of that, I want to thank our sponsor for this show, which is Vast Conference. Uh, this is a wonderful conference call facility for your business. And if you're like most of us, you want to be professional in every aspect of your business. And when you think about it, professionalism begins with those all important conference calls with clients and colleagues. What makes a conference call professional? Well, you need a dial in number that you can give out at a moment's notice. You need clear connections when you call and that your participants can dial into. The popping and delays that you can get from voice over IP can be very embarrassing and uh, just slows everything down, helps you not focus on the business at hand, but the technology that's facilitating it. And that's what you don't want to see. For large calls, the ability to manage call participants online is very important. So there is a company that's put all this together. I'm happy to tell you it's called Vast Conference and it makes you professional when it comes to your conference calls. It's affordable and very advanced. It enables you to quickly connect two or more callers on the phone. Many conference calls have three to five participants and Vast supports up to 300 callers at once. They give you both a regular dial-in number and a toll-free number and you can use these to set up your calls at any time. Uh, the calls are clear because they use fiber optic lines and high-end teleconferencing equi equipment, something you don't get from VoIP. It also includes a well-designed conference call management interface, which you can access on VAST's website to manage callers and users. And for large calls, you can do question and answer sessions. You can record any call instantly as an MP3 file with no special equipment. And you can access detailed usage tracking and billing codes for internal accounting. Fast also comes with a friendly and enthusiastic customer service team. They call it above and beyond customer service. And the pricing for this professional conference service is low and it's pay as you go. It's only two and a half cents per minute for a regular toll call and six cents per minute for 800 number calls. You decide whether to give out the higher priced uh, call or not. Uh, depending on what you what kind of service you want to extend to your clients. Uh, you can sign up fast and easy. There are no commitments or contracts. You pay only for the calls you host. And VAST is giving our audience an exclusive two business calls for free up to 300 minutes to give you a chance to try out the service. So to take advantage of that, go to vastconference.com and sign up for a free account. It's fast and easy. They'll give you a regular toll number and a toll free 800 number. So you can start using your numbers and calls right away. Be sure and use the promo code TWIL, TWIL, to get your two business calls for free. That's vastconference.com, promo code TWIL. We thank Vast Conference for their support of This Week in Law. Uh, Sherwin, we have talked before about the new lawsuit in the Google Book saga, uh, this one pertaining to Orphan Works. I understand we've had some plaintiffs added to the case and we actually have an author uh, in the class action now who claims that he um, had an orphan work that was included in uh, the, it was called an orphan work, but it was actually not out of copyright. And he stepped in to say, hey, I'm, I'm a representative of people this is happening to and it shouldn't. Um, so I know public knowledge has been following this closely. Uh, do, do you see this as a particularly important development in the Google Books saga? Well, I, I just, just to, to back up a little bit, I think what's going on right now, the, the latest lawsuit. It's actually a, a separate lawsuit from the one that was going on between the class action against uh, of the Authors Guild and the publishers against Google. Um, this is a, a new suit, a new lawsuit by the Authors Guild, not a class action, but just on behalf of their themselves as an organization and a bunch of individual authors who joined them. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's not against Google at all. It's against uh, a bunch of universities that have partnered together to do a, a big book scanning project as well. Um, but what's uh, and what's happened is this this whole book scanning project. The idea was they would take the books in their libraries, scan them into an electronic database, and then start um, sorting them out. The ones that were in the public domain, they put up uh, they put up online, uh, and then they'd start using the metadata from them for other purposes uh, to catalog them, to index them, and then they also had this project, their Orphan Works project which was going to try and find and identify uh, 
uh, potential orphan works and see if they can locate the author and find, you know, those books for whom they couldn't locate a rights holder, a publisher, or an author. And then they were going to try and, and uh, find a way to make those works accessible uh, to their faculty or students. Uh, as part of that, they put up a, this website with listing all of the books that they plan to, uh, to include in this project. And uh, as the litigation got started shortly after the lawsuit got filed, uh, I think one of the, one of the authors uh, who either was involved in the suit before or was a member of the Authors Guild uh, found, you know, uh, found one of his works on that list and said, hey, clearly I'm not an orphan. Uh, clearly my work isn't orphaned. I'm here. I'm its parent. Uh, it shouldn't be part of that project. Um, that I, I think is not, it's, I don't see that as being um, really directly applicable to the lawsuit itself, uh, mostly because the lawsuit really, uh, I see it as being much more about that initial scanning, that initial making of the digital copy of the work from the physical copy. Um, the question of what they were going to do in the future uh, with Orphan Works, I think, I think it probably isn't right. Uh, for a court to decide. Yeah, when I look at this, I hearken back to that Steve Jobs comment he made at the talk where I saw him and, and you know, sort of think of bringing it into this context. Uh, we, we remember when things, when the entirety of the world's knowledge was not online and freely ser searchable and when people objected to that, but, you know, and here's Google in this role saying, we knew death would eventually take care of that. Um, for anybody who's used Google Scholar uh, to do research and has seen the wealth of information there, but also stumbled over, you know, the paywalls you hit immediately when you find the thing that's valuable and you need, but you can't access it readily, um, you can see why there is this friction and, and the Google Books case and this new iteration going after the universities um, is important to, you know, how, what the future of that friction is going to be. Um, Terry, it seems to me as though an innovative solution to all of this, a Jobsian solution to all of this would be uh, for someone to come to the table and say, look, you're, you folks are upset because you're not getting paid. The public needs access to this stuff. We're going to figure out a way to make all that work out, you know, and maybe because Google is becoming so intricately involved in all of our lives, including our financial lives, as it, you know, attempts to move into managing uh, finances and accounts and making payments. Um, maybe there's some way forward there. What do you think? Um, yeah, it, it's possible to do that. And I think, um, you know, Google kind of did that with their book search. Um, although, uh, from what I recall, their, their initial motivation for starting to scan these books and, and at least post snippets and everything was, uh, more in engineering, they, they approached it from an engineering perspective, you know, can we do this? They weren't really thinking about, you know, the, the, uh, the copyright issues uh, on one part or, you know, where this was going to eventually lead to. So, you know, maybe in the back of their mind, they had this idea of, you know, a celestial library, um, you know, one source for all this, that you could access all this information, but they you know, initially started just as as a way to see if they could do that. But there's certainly room um, to bring this idea into fruition. And, you know, you see libraries uh, around the world um, putting more and more digital works online, starting book scanning projects. But really, you know, they're libraries, so they're limited um, financially to be able to to put together, you know, a project on scope with Google's, um, and you also have the Library of, of Congress, who, uh, you know, a branch of the government that is, has been adding more digital, digital stuff to their collections online. But again, you know, they're limited financially, um, and other resources. So, you know, when you think of you know, someone like Steve Jobs coming in, it, 
it really is someone like Google that has the financial resources. But then, of course, you have the concern that, you know, that, hey, this is a multi-billion dollar global corporation. Um, they're going to be looking out for their interests. You know, how can we ensure that, you know, the other interests involved here are taken into consideration? You know, not just the authors of the books, but also, you know, the consumers themselves, uh, other companies that might, or other organizations even, that might want to have access to these resources, um, but can't because it's all locked up under the auspices of, you know, one corporation who, who basically now is in control of all this information. And, and an interesting footnote to this is that uh, Google recently announced they've got the Dead Seed Scrolls online and available. They, of course, are out of copyright. Um, Evan, do you think that that's, that's what they're going to be limit, limited to without um, needing to litigate? Or you know, do you think that, that all of this uh, fire and brimstone about uh, the author's works and the orphan works is, is going to eventually resolve itself? Well, fire and brimstone, I think, was more of a you know an Old Testament, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, <laughs> as I understand it, are more of the early Christian period. So, um, you know, it's going to take a real cultural shift uh, for you know to occur before we're through talking about all these issues of you know is copyright going to hold everything up here? Is that going to you know what the the sticking point is going to be with all this? Because what we've seen time and time again in a number of industries and we see it even now in the kind of you know the scientific literature community uh, and the, we there was an article in our discussion points a few weeks ago i can't even remember if we even talked about it but it was kind of the unfair um you know overreaching efforts of certain online repositories to limit access to their collections even though in large part the uh, the the items in that catalog are in the public domain. So you know, there's this this idea that the incumbents have here, those who are the stewards of this information, have that is is overreaching. It's 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 a an inflated view of how strong copyright should be. So so that's one obstacle that needs to come be overcome here, and that's the norms of what those who have the actual content. Um, you know, how, how restrictive they are going to be when it comes to releasing this information. And once, you know, say that we were able to, to, to do away with those um, and, um, archaic norms, then there would still be the question of, of how copyright affects all of this stuff. And to, to dissolve the concern there and to free up content so that it's in a way um, you know that it's that it's that it's more freely available, or at least more equitably available. Um, I think we need to rethink what the copyright rights are comprised of, focusing less on the uh, right and ability to make copies, and more on the right and the ability to access a work. And the right of access is not something that is one of the enumerated rights in the Copyright Act, because the Copyright Act was written long before, you know, that was actually one of the, you know, concerns uh, that, that would go to animate, you know, the, these rights, you know, wherever they arise, whether they arise from a utilitarian perspective or some kind of a natural rights theory, you know, everybody should be entitled to their copyrights, you know, to every cow, her calf, that kind of stuff. So um, it, it's got to be something kind of a very deep, a change at a very deep rooted level and it's something that's just going to have to be uh, generational in its uh, in its shift as well. There's not going to be any quick fixes to this to this problem that we're talking about. It's something that's going to take at least uh, 15, 20, 25 years to to resolve. Hopefully, with the approaching singularity, it'll be like you know two and a half years. But uh, something like uh, something like that, you know. <laughs> Sherwin, um, yeah. I, I want to. Um to get your last thoughts on uh, the Orphan Works case and then uh, get into talking about ebooks and pick up on a thread that Evan just brought up about access. Um, so yeah, so what do you think? Uh, well, on, on the Orphan Works case, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, keeping this separate from, from the, the Google Books case, um, I think one of the biggest issues here, and, and I know, um, I can't remember if it was you, Denise, or if it was... Uh, or if it was Terry who mentioned this idea of making sure that all the stakeholders are accounted for, or, or making sure that that, uh, that you know some folks are getting paid. And the problem with the the Orphan Works lawsuit that's going on right now is 
by definition, if you're coming forward and suing over something, you're not the author of an orphan work. And the interests that you want somebody to look out for uh, in, the, in, a, in an orphan works case, and this is the problem in the, the Google Book settlement, uh, are the orphans who aren't, who are by definition aren't going to be there. And, and so one of the, the, the issues here is, is uh, whether or not basically this is a move, and, and the Authors Guild references the Google Books case over and over again and, and sort of talks about sort of the, the, the fact that um, these universities knew about the, the Google Books settlement, which, which fell apart and isn't, isn't happening, it seems. Uh, but it, it looks almost as though the Authors Guild is, is trying to position itself to be a sort of repository that would, that would represent, that would be a clearinghouse uh, for uh, a large book scanning effort to, to contribute funds to, basically, like to, uh, to hold an escrow until an author is found. And that, I, I find that a little, really concerning, that it basically becomes a pay-to-play model and you have people coming forward uh, to represent those who aren't there um, when they have their own conflicting interests with those potential orphan authors. Right. So on the one hand, we have the authors uh, trying to limit what's going to be available online when you search for it. Um, and on the other hand, we have the world of ebooks exploding, um, wrapped once again, uh, and here we thought we had done away with DRM in one industry, uh, wrapped in various flavors of DRM that uh, are not interoperable uh, from device to device. Uh, and so this stymies um, any number of people, including librarians. And I was, uh, I had a bit of a revelation last night. I was doing homework with my son or helping him do his homework. And I realized that he's now in uh, second slash third grade. And he's never had a textbook. And that much of what we do with him uh, for school involves online materials and increasingly does, you know, as time goes on. Um, so against that backdrop, there are many people, you know, who need to be able to access things either um, by searching for them or by borrowing them from a library. And in this DRM encased world, uh, that's becoming more and more problematic. Uh, Evan, did you take a look at this um, Media Shift article on uh, how librarians are facing these issues and, and what they're trying to do about it. Yeah, and this is a tough one, isn't it? It almost is hard to believe that this is a problem because you would think from the, from the starting point that the availability of information by electronic means is going to lower the cost of distribution and therefore it's going to be available to more people and uh, you know that, that it's going to uh, lower the barriers of, of entry and, and lower and, and you know reduce the obstacles do away with the obstacles to the availability of content but you know here again we've got these interests and these interests of the incumbents wanting to be very tightly attached to the to the rights of distribution and the rights of, of reproduction and so um, this is a this is a tough one to crack and it and it's going again I, I feel like I'm starting to uh, maybe it's unintentional coming up with a motif here but it's what's what's coming up here this is this is again just takes a rethinking as to what rights there are here uh, and and how those rights should be. Um, uh, how those rights should be enforced and made available to to the the ones who actually have those rights. I think it's really interesting. For example, that publishers was it Harper Collins who was saying to libraries, uh, you can only loan out a digital copy of a work what, maybe twenty six times or something like that before mm -hmm. you have to pay for it again. And isn't it interesting where that originates? It's from the theory that a paper copy of the same work would actually wear out. Uh, having been loaned out that number of times, so you know, pay up once again. Now, th you 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 got to understand uh, the publisher's interests, you know, because clearly they don't want to release it into the wild and for it to be gone uh, forever and never once have a chance to to uh, you know make more money the, with the the more people who are, who are seeing it. But at the same time, that seems a real band aid kind of solution, putting these ad hoc um, uh, rules in place. For example, the, having to repay it, uh, re pay for it again after being loaned out for 20, 26 times because that just doesn't comport with reality. That's just based on some kind of fiction uh, that, that, that happens here. So um, 
I'm going to leave it up. This is one of those where I'm just going to punt to the people who are a lot smarter than me, who spend all day thinking about these kinds of policy issues, the, the, the people who are, make purchasing decisions for libraries and the people who are in the publishing industry who are going to be smart and innovative and see how uh, the, the rights uh, as to them as content holders are going to be fully maximized and have that benefit go out to the, uh, the public interest as well. Wish I could come up with something ingenious, but uh, I'm, I've got, uh, you know, got like stuff to do this weekend. <laughs> That's too bad because we could really use a solution to this. <laughs> Terry, Terry, what do you think? Um, is, is there a solution to the competing forms of DRM and the various devices uh, that libraries want to use and be able to lend? Um, yeah, if I could come up with it, you know, I wouldn't be uh, writing a blog, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting, though. My, uh, my sister's a librarian, so we talk about this all the time. And, um, you know, just on a side note, that's kind of sweet because she hooks me up with free books all the time. But, uh, you know, we, it's not just the publishers here. It's also the ebook reader manufacturers. You know, they... You know, uh, a lot of them, Amazon and, and, and all the others, they want um, their ebooks only to be able to be read on their device. So libraries are kind of stuck, you know, when they're making the decision, do we go into lending ebooks? You know, one of the decisions they have to make is, you know, which format do we pick? Which ebook reader do we pick? If you have, you know, several different manufacturers and that they have to get, the same book for each of them, you know, all of a sudden, you know, even leaving aside the, the publisher's restrictions that they want, they're already, you know, spending all this money just acquiring the same ebook for all these different formats. So it is, there's a lot of different factors and it's not an easy issue. It's one of these things that you know, maybe 20 years from now, we'll look back and say, you know, like how, you know, look at these archaic uh, restrictions they had, you know, they only let them loan out this book for 26 times. But um, yeah, right now, you know, I think no one has really come up with the solution to this. It's just gonna, you know, it's gonna take a transitional period of time until things stabilize, formats and standards come out and that this will become something that, you know, will be a thing of the past. Yeah, darn those hard drives that actually will retain a file and let it be read more than 26 times. Although, yeah, I'm thinking most of the books I'm looking around my office here that I have on the shelf could be read more than 26 times without falling apart. So maybe that's an artificial argument they're tossing out there. Uh, what Fopo Gijo in IRC says is the problem is they, and I guess that means the publishers, are sacrificing market for control and then complaining about decreased revenue on, la on lack of control rather than super abundance. Sherwin, any thoughts on this? On that comment, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to parse that and, and my brain isn't quite parsing that, that comment. But one of the things that I did want to talk about in terms of control and Actually, Evan mentioned something really interesting a minute ago about uh, whether or not we should start thinking about copyright uh, and move away from the idea of, of copying as being sort of the actionable um, act and towards access as being the sort of thing that we're considering. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of like that idea, but I'm also really suspicious of it. I can see why we want to move away from copying as being the thing that attaches legal liability, right? Because like we make hundreds of copies of things on our computers every day and we don't think that those things should be actionable just because I forward an email or uh, you know if I, I rip a song uh, on into iTunes you know these are copies that are being made I, I run a program and multiple copies get made in RAM and, and a cache and so on you know these aren't these, these shouldn't be you know these shouldn't be um, uh, they shouldn't raise the, the attention of copyright law um, and at the same time, we do want to be able to distinguish, you know, that we do see that there's something different about whether you have a dark archive of scanned books and, a, and an archive of scanned books that people can access. And we do see, so that does seem like uh, a nice uh, thing to hang your hat on, except when you start talking about access, you also start talking about controlling uh, reading, controlling access at a really granular level. 
that mm -hmm. starts to become disturbing. I mean, when we're used to this idea, I mean, I saw some people were, were bringing up the issue of first sale. And what's so powerful about first sale is the idea that I get to own a copy and I need no permission to do all sorts of things with that copy. The fact that, that use isn't a 106 right is a really important, right? I can read something as many times as I want to. I can, I can look at it. I can read it anytime I want. Uh, it, it's not, it doesn't raise, uh, there's, there's nothing that a copyright holder can attach to that to control it. But if we make access um, a controllable right, then that really restrains not just, you know, what you can do with the information, but it actually restrains, it, it limits what I own. It limits my physical property. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And if I could just uh, address that, I mean, first of all, I wish that I was the one who had come up with this idea of copyright reform being based on a switch to emphasis on access rather than copying. But uh, I, I certainly am not responsible for that as much as I wish I would. Um, I guess my concern or it's more of like, you know, why I would advocate for access being the kind of more of the touchstone of modern copyright law is because first, the first sale doctrine is something that necessarily arose because of the physical nature of the work. There's something that's inherently unfair about giving a rights holder essentially being able to tax every time that the, the work is distributed to a, to a subsequent user when it's, you know, when the book is handed uh, over at the garage sale or in the book club or lent from the library or, or what have you. Whereas with a digital work, by its very nature, access essentially is the same thing as use. And um, I know your point, Sherwin, is that use is something that is not subject to regulation under the copyright law, but in, with modern technology, that access really is tantamount to um, you know, the, the creation of a new copy uh, which is something that indeed is protected under the copyright law or something, you know, a right that is granted, one of the Section 106 rights that comprise the bundle of, of, of the rights holder. So, you know, if we're going to still have it as a premises in, in the theory of copyright that the rights holder, you know, should be able to monetize that, which I think most people will, will argue that that's going to be the, 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 the thing that animates the incentive for the promotion of the progress and the useful sciences, um, then, you know, the monetization is going to be the only, the only reasonable place to put that is at the point of, of access. And it's not something that's all that strange, and it's not something that doesn't exist in other areas. I mean, when we think of the law of digital privacy, whether that be under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or the Stored Communications Act or, you know, trade secret misappropriation, one of the real touchstones of liability is, you know, is there access here? And the reason well, that sure. that's where liability attaches is because that's where the, the rubber meets the road and the real rights are at stake. But, but giving control at the level of access means you're giving the copyright holder very granular control over how the user gets to use the work, right? How many times a week can I read the paper? You know, how, uh, how, when am I doing this? How often am I doing this? And that granular level of control is imposing upon the use of copyrighted works a whole framework, a whole set of restrictions, and a whole set of privacy invasions as well that just have never existed before. We've never, uh, you know, uh, if we're giving, if we want to put a legal uh, hook on use, then uh, you're, 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 you're creating a world where, you know, it's, it's uh, possible to, uh, where, where first sale does become completely irrelevant, where it's possible to control things that have never been considered controllable before. Right, and California is actually looking forward to those privacy considerations and just uh, enacted a law that's called the Reader Privacy Act of 2011. It's going to become effective January 1st. That's going to require a court order uh, before anyone can gain access to that kind of information about um, your online shopping, your electronic books, your book purchases. Um, this is something the EFF has been advocating for as well as the ACLU. So it's nice that uh, California has put that in place to um, take into account that more and more of this activity is is moving to electronic format and, and has a bunch of data around it that can be sensitive. Were you happy to see that, Sherwin? 
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think it, it seems to me to be a very um, a very logical extension of the idea that I mean, this was a California state law, you know, in existence that protected the uh, the records of, of people's you know library visits, and it's now been extended to e-books. I, I see absolutely no reason why somebody should have less privacy in the electronic sphere than they they would uh, in, with physical books. Um, certainly, I mean, there's there's the technology makes it so that it's it can be easier to lose your privacy. That certainly doesn't mean that that should be the case. Right. Uh, Denise, do you see what Web 9212 is saying in IRC? But Facebook timeline shows the jury that you did read that book 27 times. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and that's actually t conflating two issues, isn't it? I think that 27 yes. times is probably in relation to the... Uh, uh, so yeah, it's funny in, in two different ways here. What we're talking about with this with this uh, privacy regulation and also with the, the licensing uh, arrangements with the publishers. So. Yes, thank you for that. Um, also, uh, one interesting thing that happens when the Supreme Court uh, resumes its term, as it has, uh, you know, here we are at the beginning of October, is is the court lets us know what cases it's not going to hear, and and that can almost be as um, forceful and important as the cases that it does decide to hear and issue an opinion on. We've had some interesting ones that it's decided not to hear, including the uh, Werner versus Autodesk case, which involves the first sale doctrine we were just talking about. And uh, also the music royalties case. Uh, Terry, you've been watching the Supreme Court's recent doings. You wanna um, tell us about both of those? Um, yeah, uh, I'll start with the download royalty thing. This is, um, of course, uh, a case uh, involving ASCAP, the uh, collecting performance, uh, public performance royalties. And they had, had gone to court uh, four years ago already um, against Real Networks and Yahoo and AOL. Um, and they, uh, as, as this progressed, this was a royalty dispute. They, uh, both parties, were disagreeing over whether downloads counted as a public performance. Um, so this, uh, the court at the district court level said, no, uh, downloads aren't a public performance. And ASCAP, of course, appealed that to the Second Circuit. And the Second Circuit again said, no, downloads aren't a public performance. Um, and then ASCAP uh, appealed it to the Supreme Court. And uh, of course, they denied to hear that, which wasn't surprising really to anyone. It's sort of, um, I, you know, I think of this, this is a dog bites man story, you know. Anyone kind of intuitively knows that a download isn't a public performance, even if they don't know the exact statutory language. Um, and in this case, ASCAP was kind of really trying to stretch the statutory language to make their argument that, you know, these downloads are not just a reproduction, but also an exercise of the Public Performance Act. Um, and it was I, I like this uh, this quip from Paul Fackler, if I'm pronouncing his name right, that you linked to Terry. He says, file this one under privileged glimpses of the bloody obvious. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, they, uh, you know, I don't, fully understand ASCAP's uh, legal argument here. Um, I think they were trying to bootstrap kind of the definition of what makes a performance a public performance into what makes a certain thing a performance in the in the first place. And, uh, you know, it was it was obvious to the district court, it was obvious to the, the Second Circuit that they didn't really have a, a leg to stand on. Um, the interesting thing about this, though, uh, is that uh, in Canada, uh, courts have come to the opposite conclusion. Um, there's been a number of, of disputes over whether downloads are public performances, and their statutes are a little bit different. They're differently worded, so this was at least uh, the court found it plausible that that a download is a public performance. And two of those cases now are uh, currently appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, which is gonna be hearing it in December. So while the story's over here in the US, you know, it, it, it continues now in Canada. So it'll be interesting to see how 
their Supreme Court uh, comes out on this issue. Right. So, but here in the U.S., the Second Circuit's determination that downloads are not public performances is going to stand for the time being, and there's no further remedy from that with the Supreme Court denying cert on this. Um, how about the Werner case, which uh, if you um, go over and read Mike Masnick's entry on Tech Dirt, um, he, he basically says that uh, you cannot uh, really reliably ever hope to apply the first sale doctrine um, to software resales in the wake of the Werner De versus Autodesk case, uh, which we've talked about before on the show. And it appears that that principle will now stand as well. That's right, yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, Evan, we, we talked about uh, Werner. Are you surprised that the, um, the Supreme Court decided not to touch it? Well, I guess so. I mean, it, they've always got to prioritize and it's probably not one of those, uh, you know, real big issues now because, um, I mean, I don't know if this would be weighing into their thinking. They weigh in so many other things when deciding to grant certiorari on something. But, uh, you know, the, the whole question of the first sale doctrine, I think, is, is declining in importance because of so much uh, software and other types of works uh, waning in market share. You know, mm -hmm. there's it's, there's no secret that more soft, and I, I always hate talking about the cloud because it starts sounding so cliche, but you know, the more stuff is being done in the cloud, it's more, you know, the application service provider model, um, you know, and, and, you know, hard copy books are on the decline. Now, you know, there's more electronic uh, works being being sold uh, than, than hard copies. So, um, you know, why is this an issue that's so important that it should be in front of the Supreme Court at, at this point? Uh, I don't have a, a good answer. So that, you know, that that's in and of itself, in my mind, is, is a good enough reason for the Supreme Court to, to let this let this stand. Yeah, that's a good point, because this case, you know, involved the physical disks of software being resold. Um, Sherwin, any thoughts on the, the Werner case? Yeah, um, I, I guess I, I, I'm, it's funny, I expected to disagree vehemently, coming into this, this podcast, I expected to disagree vehemently with Terry and, and not Evan, and I think <laughs> right, now, right now I'm disagreeing pretty strongly with Evan, because I, I think that it, it's a really, it, it, the fact that things are shifting more towards software it makes this much more important. I, I think, you know, I, I, I can see why the Supreme Court might not have granted cert. Uh, there wasn't a clear circuit split and things like that. But uh, in terms of the importance of the issue, I think it's more important than ever because we're seeing more copyrighted works attached to form contracts uh, that, that say, you know, you don't own the physical thing even though you've bought it. A lot, a lot of this case really isn't just about... Um, isn't just about how to interpret first sale. It's really about how to decide uh, when you're going to believe a EULA over the, the sort of the, the facts on the ground of the, of the transaction, whether or not you're going to believe uh, a EULA that says a, no sale has ever occurred, uh, or you're going to look at what the consumer thought happened. Uh, and you know whether or not that sale happened, whether or not the law decides that they're going to agree with, well, look, he walked into a store, he put down some money, he walked out with a piece of software, um, you know, that makes it a sale versus, uh, well, we're going to look at the fine print of this contract. That has huge implications for how the copyright law is being applied. And the fact that things are moving into the cloud uh, means that there's less and less of, a, of an opportunity for people to own things. And that makes the first sale doctrine less and less important, uh, less and less applicable and that means that the values that it was there, that it was put into copyright law to protect, aren't being protected. If we do move everything to the cloud, if we do treat everything on a licensing basis, um, then it's not. Uh, then you're going to uh, have this this situation where people um, will pay money for something and then lose access to it the next day, or suddenly find their ability to use it over time restricted, or be unable to move it from one device to another, one place to another. Uh, and so on and so forth. Right. I, I think those are really important considerations that probably need to come up in a different case because the facts of this one with an actual physical copy being at issue um, probably, I don't know, might not have let the court get to those important points about what is it that you are capable of buying as opposed to having licensed to you for perhaps 26 reads 
for example. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I do want to um, look at a couple of First Amendment points uh, as we get down toward the end of the show. Evan, there in Chicago, you've got a rogue judge who uh, who thinks that uh, all this recording of police will lead to excessive snooping around and uh, talk about you know having different laws or different judicial decisions in different parts of the country. Uh, just last month, we saw in Massachusetts decide squarely that recording the police is a First Amendment right in, in that jurisdiction. So what's going on in your neck of the woods there? Well, um, you're talking about Judge Posner, I think, who sits on the mm -hmm. Court of Appeals of the Seventh Circuit here. And, oh, he's by no means a rogue. I, I love Judge Posner, you know, because I, uh, I want to stay in his good graces in case I have to appear in front of him, of course. So uh, he's a brilliant guy, always right, right? Um, now, he wrote an article or, uh, oh, no, this was actually what, something that he had said in uh, uh, during the oral arguments of a case that that's appearing before, uh, you know, that that has up on appeal in the Seventh Circuit about the First Amendment uh, protection that people have for recording uh, police officers. So, um, this is an issue that that uh, you know could give that, that there on for which there could be a split on the circuits if the Seventh Circuit comes down on a different side of this than the First Circuit. In the Massachusetts case that went up to the First Circuit, they the court did find did hold that there is a First Amendment interest, uh, actually very important First Amendment interest that people have in holding public officials like the police accountable, being able to to record them, make video and audio recordings of of their conduct, arresting someone. And so, I guess Judge Posner, you know, expressed some skepticism during oral arguments of this case saying, you know, why, why is this such an important First Amendment consideration? And, and um, you know, Mike Masnick took issue with that and, and it's easy to, to engage in some hyperbole and saying, oh, this is so dangerous. We've got this Court of Appeals judge who, who evidently hates the First Amendment. I don't think that's exactly true. If you listen carefully to what Judge Posner was saying in the opinion, he's actually a little bit more concerned about the First Amendment interest, the privacy interest, I'm sorry, uh, of the uh, of the person who's actually the um, dealing with the police, the the, the person that the police uh, the, is arresting or or dealing with or, or or talking to. An example that Judge Posner, the hypothetical that he poses to uh, the attorneys for the ACLU who are arguing the case was, you know, suppose a guy's been pickpocketed and he's agitated and embarrassed by the fact that this has happened to him, and he goes and talks to the police, and then you've got a guy there recording it. You know, how do we? How do we deal with the the privacy interest of this guy who wants to go to the police? Um, you know, is that is that fair? Is the, should the First Amendment trump that privacy right there? Uh, and he also brings in some concern about you know gang members, um, uh, informants turning in. Uh, other gang members may be less likely to go to the cops and uh, narc on other gang members if they know that somebody's going to be able to film it and put it on YouTube and tag it and and, and you know put it on. MySpace. If you, if you read all these cases, it seems like everything's still happening on MySpace with all people flashing gang signs and stuff. But that's neither here nor there. So um, that's all going on in the Seventh Circuit. But there's been a couple of uh, lower or trial court uh, judges here in Illinois, and I haven't seen the opinions, you know, because these are there probably were no written opinions written. But there have been a couple of different cases here at the state court level where uh, Illinois does have a, an eavesdropping statute that would prohibit the recording of, of police. And so a couple of state court trial court judges have held that to be unconstitutional. And uh, so, you know, at least in our state courts here, um, we're, we're getting uh, some different uh, different um, leanings than what Judge Posner was expressing. But that, that uh, opinion from the Seventh Circuit uh, isn't out yet. So... There's stuff happening here on this issue in Illinois and the Seventh Circuit. So within the next six months or a year, there'll be some, some interesting things to report. And maybe we'll see a circuit split on this. And it's something that the Supremes might be hearing in uh, 2012 or 2013. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, keep an eye on it. Sherwin, is this something public knowledge is keeping an eye on as well? We don't tend to do as much uh, uh, on privacy issues as an organization, so mm -hmm. I, I, I'd say probably not. Though I mean, I have to say, even even given that uh, you know maybe Judge Posner's comments were blown out of proportion, I do think it's weird that uh, there's this sudden concern over over privacy uh, in a public space when we have all sorts of case law on the books about the lack of uh, an expectation of privacy out in public. Uh, and, and, and now this is, this is becoming a, a, an issue when the police are involved. I, I, I think that 
you know, it, it's it's proper to recognize, you know, to, to, to issue spot and find potential, you know, potential issues with this. But I think it, it really is pretty clear cut. I don't think that these comments, uh, you know, from the judge necessarily indicate that he's, uh, you know, gone way off or that this is necessarily going to be reflected in the opinion. But uh, but it, it, you do. I mean, it, it, they are um, in this context of the facts of this case, pretty, um, pretty disturbing. Um, because certainly, I mean, there's, there's no, uh, you, you do have a first amendment right to be out in public with a camera. Uh, and as you know, the first amendment isn't there to make us comfortable. It's there to protect, you know, fundamental rights. Yeah, per usual, we're getting some good comments from IRC, one from Virgil, uh, who points out that police cars and, and police officers routinely video and audio record things during stops to be able to show that they did the right thing. So it seems, you know, strange that we have these arguments being made around the country that the public wouldn't be able to have their own version of that kind of activity as well. Um, Terry, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, just picking up on what uh, Sharon was saying about Posner's remarks uh, specifically, you know, I think they were really taken out of context. I mean, this is during oral arguments, um, you know, and he's, this isn't reflective of what he, what his view is on this case. You know, this could be just, you know, throwing out a straw man to see how, you know, the ACLU will respond or just sort of trying to, you know, bring the argument to a, to a logical end. So, you know, I think in that, you know, the internet's kind of picked up on this remark that, you know, Judge Posner is uh, against, you know, these pesky citizens snooping on police. But, um, you know, you really have to put it in context to, to what the purpose of the oral arguments are in front of the court. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I do, I, uh, on a broader sense, I, I think it's interesting that this has kind of been in the news lately about all these things. And, you know, I'll be, be uh, I, I'll agree here with Sherwin. Um, surprisingly, but yeah, this is definitely uh, one of the purposes of the First Amendment to hold public officials accountable. And so I think, especially if they're in a public place, you know, hopefully the courts all um, agree with that, that this is something that should be protected, that any law against this should be struck down. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll see, I guess. Well, since I referenced to the IRC a minute ago, now they're all trying to erase a particular image from their minds in there thanks to Lee's comment. And so I have to share it with all of you, too, because Lee thinks that the Supreme Court members would like to see Justice Scalia in a pink cocktail dress for some reason. I don't know why Lee thinks this, but uh, now we can all have that image emblazoned in our minds. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, and uh, one thing that I have as a standing rule here on This Week in Law is that if there's ever the occasion to talk about, oh, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, or Firefly, for example, in a legal context, we're going to go ahead and do that. And uh, this week's instance of that comes from Univers University of Wisconsin professor James Miller, who had a poster from Firefly on his wall uh, and was initially told by University of Wisconsin, which is a public entity, uh, to take down his poster, which uh, had the quote, you don't know me, son, so let me explain this to you once. If I ever kill you, you'll be awake, you'll be facing me, and you'll be armed. Um, that apparently was not politically correct enough for uh, the university's administration, and uh, he was asked to take it down. Uh, but then a hue and cry went out about the First Amendment ramifications of that. And lo and behold, the chancellor has backtracked and allowed Professor Miller to go ahead and restate his poster with Mal's wonderful quote. Um, so there's a little First Amendment victory for you all to ponder for the week. Uh, Evan, are you happy that we've got uh, Mal's quote back on the professor's wall? Oh, sure. I mean, that you know, there, it's not hard to find stories like this where administrators overreact to, to things like this. And, you know, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough situation that, um, that uh, you know, people in charge of educational institutions 
have that it's a real challenge to balance these rights because you know it's it's been what 12 only 12 years since columbine and there's all kinds of this all kinds of this violence and so you know if you're thinking of the kids who were who are in who are undergraduates now you know they would have been just uh, in grammar school and, and younger when columbine happened so so school violence is something that's that's really part of the the, the culture and something that that administrators have to be vigilant about, but then you got this thing called the First Amendment. So um, you know it's almost lose lose for these administrators in doing something like this. So I guess uh, uh, in, in something like a professor's poster, it's it's rational that the uh, that the First Amendment would uh, would win out on, on something like this. Yep. What do you think, Sherwin? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm glad the quotes back up. I. I you know, don't see, didn't see any particular reason why it should have created a problem. And I thought that, you know, in, at least some of the reporting that I'd seen, that uh, nobody reported feeling threatened by it. I thought the campus police just saw it and thought, well, that's not quite right, um, mm -hmm. and which is bizarre because the whole point of the quote is that if there is ever going to be, you know, if I ever, if, you know, if, if Mal's ever going to shoot Simon, it's because Simon's trying to kill him. It's like, I, I'll only shoot you in self-defense. Uh, which is, I think, an, an admirable statement. Um, and, uh, and and even, you know, but even beyond just the, the, in, the inability to sort of parse the quote um, is just this idea that the mention of violence is somehow um, taboo, which is strange. Um, and, and I, I, you know, and I think inappropriate for a, a college campus because you need to discuss violence. Um, yes. Just to, yeah, to discuss our world. Right, and and I think this this whole question of you know what the discussion of violence and and how it can come out at college um, is is itself worthy of that kind of unpacking. I also think that someone needs to send Professor Miller a Han shot first T-shirt as well to go along with his poster. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Terry? Um, yeah, I mean this. This whole story, it was, uh, you know, set off a little bit of a firestorm on the internet. Um, clearly, uh, you know, it's a poster. It's a, with a quote, there was nothing threatening about it. The police overreacted, but there was plenty of overreaction on both sides. If you look at um, uh, one side I saw had the email exchange between the chief of police of the university and this professor, um, you know, and the chief of police had sent him an email, you know, look, I, you, I knocked on your door, you weren't here, I took down this poster, we need to talk about it. And uh, right away, the, uh, the professor responded back, you know, fascist, fascist, how dare you take away my First Amendment rights? So, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. personally, a little bit of an overreaction there. Um, maybe the university could have handled it a little better, but they, you know, eventually, obviously, they saw that um, after a lot of public pressure too, you know, they, there was, uh, that they were in the wrong. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have been surprised if even without this public pr pressure, they would have eventually realized they were in the wrong anyway. But, um, you know, it's, uh, as far as this story taking storm, you know, I guess it just had all the, all the right ingredients, you know, if it was a, a poster besides Firefly, you know, maybe people wouldn't have paid attention online, but you know, here you go, you got all the things for the perfect storm of uh, a nice little internet uh, viral firestorm. Absolutely, public university teacher poster plus Firefly, happen every time. Mm -hmm. um, you know what else is gonna happen every time, and this is our uh, tip of the week for you this week, is that if you name a social network something with the word book in it, you're gonna get yourself sued by Facebook. So just don't be doing that. Uh, there is a Northbrook, uh, Illinois based social networking site for teachers that calls, them, calls itself TeachBook that got sued last year. We talked about it at the time. Uh, they, uh, they tried to have that suit dismissed, they lost. So it's going to go forward uh, without too much surprise. Um, so there's our tip, you know, you can use the word book in lots and lots of ways, but if you're going to hang it on a social networking site, don't be surprised if, uh, if they come a gun and after you. Um, Evan, this is in your neck of the woods. Um, were you surprised that this case uh, got to continue? 
Yeah, fa uh, Facebook's overreaching here, and and you know I, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. I, you know, I, I it was a denial of a motion to dismiss, so it doesn't mean that Facebook has won the case by any stretch of the imagination. There's still going to be all kinds of evidence if they don't settle it. They'll probably settle it. Um, what this does to me is makes me very hopeful that. Um, Timelines.com, another Chicago company, is going to be successful in its trademark lawsuit against Facebook, the one that it filed last week over the Timelines feature uh, of, of the redesigned Facebook that, I guess, hasn't been fully launched yet, but is in the process of, of being rolled out. So I hope Timelines.com beats the pants off of Facebook in its trademark lawsuit, if anything, as quid pro quo for Facebook's silly lawsuit against uh, another Chicago company here. I guess I'm... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the people in the chat room are, uh, we're talking about the Ken Burns show prohibition. Maybe I'm just getting kind of a cocky Chicago attitude about this, but uh, I mm -hmm. hope that, uh, I hope that there's uh, some, um, I hope there's some um, e equality, we'll say it, we'll put it that way when it comes to these uh, silly trademark things. Yes, we will, we will stay tuned for that one, what's going to happen with Timeline. Just uh, as an aside, it's worth noting that uh, that Facebook was um, almost enjoined from being able to release Timeline, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Yeah, um, your old your old firm is representing Timeline, so you should ah, be you should around. very very nice. Um, so that's uh, that's good to see, and we will um, definitely check in on that and see what happens because it is pretty interesting because Facebook has been quite aggressive about its book trademark in uh, the area of social networking in particular. Um, finally, our resources of the week today, uh, and there are two, come from within our twit, twit network here uh, because they're so great. I don't want listeners of our show to miss them because I think that they're things that will appeal to you a whole bunch. Um, out there on other twit shows, uh, Triangulation 24, for example, has John Perry Barlow on it. And I think this is not the first time he's been on Triangulation, but Tom and Leo have a great big long talk with him where they cover all kinds of issues about uh, using IP law for social control, uh, discussing circulating the tapes, net neutrality, and more. It's really a wonderful show, so give that a listen. And uh, also last week on Security Now, Steve Gibson uh, did a nice deep look at the ramifications of the Silk browser on the Amazon Kindle Fire. So I encourage you to check that out too, since we touched on those issues as well. So those were our resources for you. Go check out those great shows. And uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this week's This Week in Law. Thank you so much, Sherwin, for joining us from Public Knowledge. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, glad you could come back and uh, we really appreciate the work that you guys do there at Public Knowledge. It's really important. Is there anything in particular that you're working on right now you want to give a plug to and encourage people to check out on your site? Oh, sure. Well, um, one of the biggest things we're working on right now is uh, uh, there's a, a bill that's going to be dropped in the House. It's already been introduced in the Senate. Called, uh, they call it in the Senate the Protect IP Act. I think uh, it's meant to be an anti-piracy measure, but we think it does some really um, uh, dangerous or disturbing things to, to, the, to the Internet. Uh, so I, I encourage people to check, by, uh, check out publicknowledge.org. Uh, take a look at the site. Take a look at uh, our action on uh, uh, Protect IP and net neutrality, any number of things. Great. Thank you so much, Sherwin. Hey, Terry, it's been great to uh, meet you and have you on the show. Definitely. It's been a pleasure uh, being here, Denise. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy your blog, Copy, Copy Hype. Um, it, tell, us, tell us about that blog. How long have you been writing it and what other projects are you involved in? Uh, I started that last year, August of 2010, um, just sort of something uh, on the side to uh, sort of fill a void, I think. Um, have a discussion about copyright issues from a more uh, pro copyright owner perspective. Um, other than that, you know, I'm just keeping busy with some consulting work and some freelance work. So, yeah, it's been great to be on here. Thank you so much. Uh, folks can find Terry on Twitter. He's Terrence Hart there. And I'm sorry, I forgot to give out Sherwin's Twitter. He's Sherwin PK over on Twitter. And then there is, of course, at Internet Cases on Twitter, our Evan Brown. Thanks so much, Evan, for joining us as well. 
hey, thanks, Denise. Uh, great time as usual. Uh, you know, awesome, awesome talking to you, Sherwin. Awesome talking to you, uh, Terry. Uh, glad to uh, glad to talk to you again, Sherwin. And nice to meet you, Terry. So fun time, Denise. Have a uh, have a good uh, weekend. Great uh, a great week, and can't wait till next week. I know, me too. Uh, we are going to have Stefan Kinsella come back and join us next week. And as I said, Evan, you've got Ernie uh, coming up shortly on what will be our fifth anniversary show later on this month. So uh, hopefully you can round up that Saints jersey in short order. I'll see what I can do about that. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I can always ask him to send me one. Yes, perhaps that would be uh, in order. Um, folks, you can find Twill at twit.tv slash twill, where you can find the archive of all of our shows. And we record Fridays at 11 Pacific, 1800 UTC. We love it when you tune in live, but if you can't, you can find us on iTunes and uh, distributed on all the Mediafly outlets. So we're gonna be on YouTube, we're gonna be on your Roku box. We're gonna be there easy to find. And of course, you can always go to the website to watch and or listen at your leisure. And uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. You can find me and hit me up off the show, uh, Denise at twit.tv. Let me know what's on your mind. Uh, or on Twitter, I'm at dhowell there. Or you can just find me under my very own name, Denise Howell, on Google+. So that's it for This Week in Law. We uh, really appreciate your joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode, hopefully. Take care.